when you have a rectangular equation like f of x equals x squared, for instance, and it creates a graph that looks like a parabola, if you transform the equation, for instance, you make a new equation that's f of x plus a or a times f of x, the new graph is, is related to the original graph. And for rectangular, it's, it's very predictable. The plus a ends up shifting the curve up by a units, whereas the a in front of it ends up making a vertical stretch, whereas if there's a negative in front of, in front of it, it gets flipped over the x-axis. If there's a negative here, it gets flipped over the y-axis, which in this case, it's symmetrical, so you wouldn't know the difference. And if there's a plus a, it moves it to the left by a units. And if there's an a inside the parentheses, it performs a horizontal compression. Horizontal compression isn't that different from a vertical stretch in that, for, for, for parabola at least, it still gets like skinnier. Now let's see what happens. So if you take a look, <clears throat> here I have the same sorts of transformations, but my function is now f of theta. And here's the graph of f of theta equals 2 sine theta plus 2. We have that cardioid. Um, and we want to see what is the effect of putting a coefficient in front or a negative here or a negative there or a plus alpha there or what if the coefficient is in front of the theta or if there's a plus alpha. We know that for rectangular graphs this one does a vertical stretch, this does a flip over the x-axis, this is a flip over the y-axis, this is a shift to the right, this does a horizontal compression, and this does a shift up. But let's look at what happens in polar graphs. For the first one, this A performs a dilation. Not just a vertical stretch, but a full-on dilation where the new shape is similar to the old one. And the reason that is is because we have some distance here, R, and this line gets scaled up, so now it's AR. So it's, it's whatever A is times as big, and in doing so, the entire shape gets magnified. So that one is a dilation. In the second one, uh, for R equals negative, so the way this works is if I have this point, let's just say that it's 5 comma 30 degrees. So f of 30 degrees equals 5. So when I put a negative, it turns into negative 5, and that makes it have this point over here, negative 530. And that's why this one is, I know it looks like a reflection over the x-axis or over the polar axis, but it's actually a reflection, uh, reflect, reflect in the pole, like the origin. So it's got point reflection, not, even though in this case it's the same as if it were reflected over the polar axis. Uh, for this third one, this one, it looks like the same picture as that last one, but it, it, it's, it's for a different reason. For this one, it's actually reflected over the, pol over the polar axis. There's theta, there's minus theta. For the fourth scenario, it does something interesting. It does a rotation. Because, like in this case, it looks like um, theta is about 150 degrees. So whereas in the original, we'd say f of theta is equal to um, 2. f of theta uh, with this plus a 
if r equals f of theta plus, let's say, 150 degrees, well, that's going to need, when theta equals negative 150 degrees, it's going to end up at the same place that this, that this graph did when theta was 0. And that's why we have this portion over here on the right of the center. That actually ends up over here. So it's this point here is negative 1, or sorry, is 2 comma negative 150 degrees. And this point over here is 2 comma 0 degrees. So rotation is very difficult in rectangular, but in polar rotation is very simple. Now, when there's a number here, it causes it to become a rose curve. And that's a lot different than in the rectangular way. And finally, the plus A, which was so easy for rectangular, it ends up actually distorting the figure where every point ends up moving out by, in this case, it ends up sort of two further than it used to be. And you might think that that's going to just enlarge the shape but it doesn't because this zero ends up becoming a two and we no longer have this like dimple here but it's more like a circle so that's like a distortion I don't even know what that's called so that takes care of the different transformations now I just wanted to mention something that could have been done in another lesson also sometimes you have a complicated equation you have no idea like what it looks like this is rectangular but you want to change it into uh, into polar still? Well, it's possible. You could take anything and use x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. So this one, for instance, would be 2 r cosine theta r sine theta equals 1. You can actually go further and say r squared, those are the two r's, is equal to 1 over 2 sine theta cosine theta. And if you recognize that as something familiar, that's actually the sine of the double angle formula for sine. You can even go further and say r squared equals cosecant. It would be fine to leave it like this also. Now going in the other direction can be kind of difficult. Like here's one, you know, the, the main identities we use are that r squared equals x squared plus y squared and r cosine theta equals x and r sine theta equals y. Those are the main things we use. But we look at something like number 11, it doesn't look that promising because we have this 2 theta here. However, if you change cosine 2 theta into 2 cosine squared theta minus 1, which is one of the identities, and then distribute the 3 through 6 cosine squared theta minus 3. Now, we really wish, this is regular r, we really wish there was an r squared here, which we, because then we'd have r squared cosine squared, which we could turn to r cosine theta squared. We have a thing for r cosine squared, but we can't just stick an r squared there. But we can multiply both sides by it. So now we have r cubed. That r cubed, I'm going to write as um, x squared plus y squared. That's r squared. And then it's times another r. I'm going to take care of that by putting a 3 over 2 here. It's kind of like uh, x squared plus y squared times the square root of x squared, that, that's r squared. Let me clean this up a little bit. Get rid of all this. So the r cubed, I could think of it as r squared times r, which is x squared plus y squared times the square root of x squared plus y squared. But that's also the same thing as saying x squared y squared to the first times x squared plus y squared to the one-half, and that's where this 3 over 2 would have come from. On the right-hand side, I have 6. This r squared cosine squared 
is x squared. And the 3r squared is minus 3x squared plus y squared. So you could do some complicated things using these identities, even if we have no idea what these different curves look like. Uh, just to show you one more, for number 15, for number 15 here, this was actually one that we, we did, a, um, we graphed it, it was like a line that did not pass through 0, 0, but it didn't pass through the pole. But I'm going to pretend I didn't know that. Only thing I can really do is do the expansion. Cosine A minus B is cosine A cosine B plus sine A sine B. That R is um, outside the whole thing. Distribute through. R cosine theta, cosine pi over 6 is, is radical 3 over 2. And sine pi over 6 is 1 half. The R got distributed to that also. R sine theta times 1 half equals 2. R cosine theta can be replaced with x. And R sine theta can be replaced with y. And using tricks like that, we're able to make more complicated equations. Okay, that's going to do it for this one.